Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am Krista Burns, uh, your host at the Nebraska Library Commission. And Encompass Live is Library Commission's weekly online event. We do this every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, for about an hour. Depending. Um, we cover commissioning activities um, and any topics that may be of interest to Nebraska librarians across the state. We have guest speakers come in sometimes and we have our own commission staff as we have this morning. Um, we do a mixture of things here, presentations, webinars, um, book reviews, um, anything we can think of that might be useful or that I requested. Uh, today we have our technology innovation librarian, Michael Sowers, who is going to tell you all about Creative Commons. Right. right? Everything yep. you ever want to know. <laughs> well, enough. Yes. Enough to get you started. Yes. And as I said, he has a very full presentation. So he's going to go straight through it. Um, if you do have questions, feel free to type them into the questions section of your interface. And at the end, as we have time, we'll answer those. Um, so just put them in there. We'll save them up. And then we'll see what kind of questions there are and take a look at them um, at the very end. Great. Great. Good to go. OK. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to dive right in here. Uh, my name is Michael Sowers. I work here at the Commission as the Technology Innovation Librarian, and I do um, a lot of things technology related, and I'm also kind of interested in things around copyright and uh, Creative Commons, as we'll talk about here, and, and how technology uh, impacts that issue. So uh, I'm just going to go ahead and dive right in and warn you that I do talk a little quickly during this presentation, but that's okay. I need the um, well, I need focus on the, or else my keyboard doesn't work. There we go. Okay, so technology solved. <laughs> Listen carefully. By accepting this material, uh, you agree on behalf of your employer to release me from all obligations and waivers arising from any and all non-negotiated agreements, licenses, terms of service, shrink wrap, quick wrap, browse wrap, confidentiality, non-disclosure, non-compete, and acceptable use policies, i.e. bogus agreements that I have entered into with your employer, its partners, licensors, agents, and assigns in perpetuity without prejudice to my ongoing rights and privileges, you further represent that you have the authority to release me from any bogus agreements on behalf of your employer. So now that we have sure. the licensing agreement uh, out of the way, let me just give you a little bit of background here. One, um, I am not a lawyer, um, so please do not consider that I'm giving any sort of legal advice here. I have my own opinions, I've studied a little bit of the law, but I am definitely not a lawyer. Uh, however, uh, I have, little old me has been at the wrong end of a DMCA takedown notice, uh, twice actually, so, so I've kind of been on the wrong end of the law, uh, so to speak. Um, I'm also a, a published author, I write articles, I've, I'm, I've written several books, and um, I've also been pirated myself, uh, twice. So um, literally I've been on both ends of this, I've been accused of pirating things and I've been pirated myself. So. Um, you know, take, take that in consideration when you're thinking about the opinions that, that I espouse here today. So a little bit of background, let's talk about copyright. Copyright is a government thing, it's in the Constitution, and typically what we see out of copyright is something like this uh, that you'll uh, see in most books. Um, I tend not to read my slides, but this one definitely uh, is worth it. All rights reserved. No part of this book may be reproduced in any form or by any electronic or mechanical means, including information storage and retrieval systems, without permission in writing from the publisher, except by a reviewer who may quote brief passages in a review. This is what we're, most of us are used to. This is what is in most books. If you take a look at the copyright page and, and bother say, this is kind of the boilerplate uh, that's in there. And if you think about it, copyright is restrictive. It is meant to say that in order to promote the progress of the useful arts, which could be a whole conversation in and of itself, we are going to allow uh, the creator of those useful arts a, a certain level of control over their work for a certain period of time. It's originally 14 years. Um, in some cases now it's life plus almost 100 years in the case of an author. So things are moving faster, but they get these, these uh, restrictions in what other people can do. Uh, for even a longer period of time. We'll come back to that. Now, how has technology kind of run into copyright? There's, I can give you a few examples here. Um, the first one, I don't know if, if uh, anybody recognizes this, but this is the uh, skit, uh, the Menomena song from the very first episode of The Muppet Show. I, I went back and watched it recently. It was in the very first episode. And um, so in, in some live presentations, I'll actually play a bit of this, this video here. And what some um, 
generally younger individuals have done, have created what's known as anime music videos. And what they'll do is they'll take a um, um, Japanese animation, anime, uh, and they'll change the soundtrack and they'll create a music video to another song. And this one, it is available on YouTube last time I checked. It's called Muppet Hunter D. <laughs> and um, uh, it takes the uh, Vampire Hunter D anime and creates a music video on the Minamino song. And so it, it's creative, it, it's amusing if you know the Mucho and you know Vampire Hunter D, oh, yeah. which I do. Um, it, it's even funnier just by the, the, the juxtaposition of those two uh, sources of content. This is what would be known as a mashup. And mashups uh, have been around for a long time. This is one of them. And technically, this would, under copyright, without permission, of uh, the people at the Muppet Show and the guy who wrote the song and all the people behind Vampire today would be technically illegal. But very popular and easy to do because of technology today. Mashups themselves come from the music world. Uh, this is one example here. Uh, DJ Danger Mouse created what was called the Grey Album. Uh, what he did was he took the Beatles' White Album Music and Jay-Z's Black Album Lyrics, so we have rap lyrics and Beatles music, and mashed them up and created the Grey Album. Uh, this was, let's say, frowned upon by the music industry, and he was ordered to take it off the Internet. Um, problem is, is that pretty much once you put something on the Internet, <laughs> it ain't disappearing. If you know where to look, you can find it. It's a very interesting listen. Uh, another example from a few years ago, was uh, Dean Gray's American Edit. This was an album put together based on Green Day's American Idiot um, and then uh, mixed with everybody from the Doctor Who theme music to Johnny Cash. Uh, it's a very interesting listen also. And there are other major artists. This gentleman in the middle here in front of his laptop is known as Girl Talk and he mixes in one song the contents from literally hundreds of other pieces of music, creates mashups that way. Um, I mean, just to be able to do that, I, I produce podcasts of what we're doing here, and I know what's involved in editing that audio. I don't even want to think about what's involved in editing a hundred couple of songs together to create a new um, a, a new song, so to speak. Making the three seconds that you want. Oh, or half a second. <laughs> and, I mean, it's, it's, it's insane. The software's out there. I've used it, but it, it, it's complicated. It takes some work. It takes some talent, I would argue. <laughs> but all of these examples are technically illegal under the current copyright regime that we have today. And I've, uh, because of my interest in this, I've started reading copyright statements in books and on CDs and things like this. And I've actually found some very interesting examples. This is actually an, an audio book. Uh, production, um, and it says here, all rights reserved, all rights of the producer of the recordings and the owners of this works reserved, unauthorized mm -hmm. copying, hiring, renting, public performance, and broadcasting is strictly prohibited, or Horace will give you a serious suntan. There's Horace, the, the Egyptian god there, and he plays into the story that is on the CD. So, you know, they're, they're admitting that, you know, it's kind of an amusing sort of thing. Um, another one, if you're really interested in this topic, this is like a 700-page trade paperback published by, I think, MIT, or Zone Books, excuse me, um, on copying and facsimiles and copyright, and I'm like a quarter of the way through it after two years. Um, but I noticed its copyright statement. Okay? You have never heard a copyright statement like this, and I will read it to you because it's worth hearing. All rights reserved on the international and pan-American copyright conventions. No part of this book may be reproduced replicated, reiterated, duplicated, conduplicated, retyped, transcribed by hand, manuscript or cursive, read aloud and recorded on audio tape, platter or disc, lip synced, stored in a retrieval system, or transmitted in any form or by any means including genetic, chemical, mechanical, optical, xerographic, holographic, electronic, stereophonic, ceramic, acrylic, or telepathic, Except for that copying permitted by Sections 107 and 108 of U.S. Copyright Law, and except by reviewers for the public press who promise to read the book painstakingly all the way through before writing their reviews without prior written permission from the publisher. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I once gave this talk in um, Jamaica at a conference where they had translators going mm -hmm. with translator booths, and I had to apologize to them afterwards <laughs> for, for making them translate that into three languages uh, on the way here. But there's other examples that I've read, and, and, and let me uh, share um, one other one with you real briefly. It, it basically, it's the basic one that I kind of shared at the beginning. 
But um, what, what they end up doing, this publisher, they say, well, okay, there are these exceptions. We, we, we accept fair use, which we'll get to in a moment. And if you want to um, quote from this book in a review, we say that's okay. okay? But then they add that they, this review, if, if it's to be printed in a magazine or newspaper or electronically transmitted on radio or television. Now, I know this publisher, and he's one of mine, so I'm, one day I'm going to have to have a conversation with him when he finally gets around to publishing my book, because if we think about their, the right, they're saying that, yes, you can quote from this book if you're going to write a review, as long as that review is in a magazine, newspaper, or on radio or television. Uh -oh. Yeah, well, Krista, can you think of any other places where you might write a review? I don't know. <laughs> um, how about Amazon? Uh -huh. Okay, according to this publisher, they say... They're reserving the right to not allow you to write a review on Amazon or maybe yeah. put, put, put on your own blog. Okay. You know, do they really have that right to reserve? Can they say, well, yes, you can quote from this for review, but only in these certain circumstances? Sounds like somebody hasn't caught up with updating their copyrights. That was from a book published in 2007. That's... <laughs> yeah, well, you know. So Someone has been using the same statement for 20 years. Maybe. Has no reason yeah. to, thinks they have no reason to. Exactly. So the question this kind of leads us to is, is what about fair use? Right? In other countries it's called fair dealing. Um, in Canada I know it's called fair dealing. I think also in the UK. And here in the States we call it fair use. And fair use is actually covered under three sections of the law. Okay, So we're going to talk a little law here for just a section. second. And here's 17 U.S.C., the Copyright Law, Section 107. Okay? And this is where fair use is defined. And this is where it gets real fun. Right? Because in order to um, say fair, you, you, what you've done is fair use, they have to, the judge, judge, this is important, has to take into account the purpose and character of the use, okay? uh, the nature of the work, the amount that you've copied, and the effect upon the potential market for the value of the copyrighted work. Okay, so you know whether you made or didn't make any money on it actually isn't necessarily relevant. Right? And that's and, people always quote yeah, that. right. Well, I'm yeah. not making any money off of it. So yeah, funny. well, but if you're preventing other people from the people who have the rights from making money mm -hmm. by giving away for free, that could theoretically do it. And fair use is an affirmative defense. So what that means is somebody has to charge you with copyright violation. And you have to say, yes, I violated copyright, but what I did was legal under this exception. Okay. The other area we want to take into account is Section 108. Obviously, I'm not going to read all this. Okay. This is the exception for libraries and archives. It basically says libraries have the right to, in certain cases, make backup copies, to rebind something for preservation purposes, that sort of thing. Okay. So libraries, in general, are kind of covered. Okay. Um, then you have a little-known section called Section 113C, which has to do with the creation of useful works. And the idea is, for example, um, let's say I'm a bookseller and I want to print a catalog of books I'm selling. I'm allowed to use an image of the book because that helps in the sale of the book. Okay. Um, so, you know, when I've talked with publishers and they're saying, well, uh, you have to get permission for this screenshot. I'm like, oh, well, but isn't that a useful work because I'm promoting the service or I'm reviewing the service? I mean, imagine if Library Journal had to get permission for every book cover that they actually published in their book, in their magazine. Unlikely. Section 113C is what covers that. Um, so at this point, we're all perfectly clear on how fair use works, right? How about you, Krista? Are you you're, you're clear? Oh, yeah. Sure. Yeah, sure. Okay. All right. <laughs> um, so fair use is one of those things that, I, in my opinion, kind of common sense has gone out the window. Okay. Let me show you an example. Um, this would be another video. Yeah, I know you've seen this one. Um, a woman posted a 29-second video of her toddler kind of dancing around the kitchen. Okay. On the radio, in the background, happened to be Princess Let's Go Crazy, which the copyright is owned by Universal Music Publishing Group. She put this up on YouTube. I mean, it was fuzzy. Like, if you didn't know the song, you couldn't figure out what the song was. But Universal sued and saying, you are violating our copyright for posting that 29-second incidental snippet. She didn't pick Let's Go Crazy as the soundtrack of this video. It just happened to be what was on the radio. She sued under the, or she was sued under the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. It was taken off. 
The Electronic Frontier Foundation got involved saying, look, this is obviously fair use. You can't do this. It eventually was reinstated, and she did, as I understand it, end up winning, but it took several years. Insane. Yeah. Um, you know, most people, I would argue, would say, that's fair use. Did it prevent any sales? It was 29 seconds out of a four-minute song. If anything, it might have promoted the sales. sales. Right, exactly. That's a, what's that song? Let's find out what it right. is. And, yeah. So what a lot of people argue, and I would probably agree, is that you have these very large corporations going after very small individuals to protect their business, which they have every right to do. I, I, I'm not going to argue that they don't have a right to protect their business. But can we think of any other large companies that have basically based their business on the reuse of pre-existing content? Anybody recognize any of these movies? <laughs> okay. These did Disney. Okay, Disney created the company based upon the works of others. Imagine if Hans Christian Anderson could say, no, 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 you can't make a movie out of my work. Okay. The last time copyright was extended, a certain character was about to go into the public domain, and somehow copyright got extended. Really? And got extended. It's called the Sonny Bono Copyright Extension Act. Do you know where Sonny Bono represented? Yes. Where? California. California. <laughs> Covered Anaheim. Covered this guy. We know this guy. This guy's Mickey Mouse. Okay. Mickey Mouse used to look like this. Okay. And originally, Mickey Mouse looked like this. Do you know the name of that character? Steamboat Willie. Steamboat Willie. Okay. All right. How many of you knew Steamboat Willie? Okay. Do you know where Steamboat Willie came from? You're, you're looking at my slides. She's, she's looking at my handouts. Okay. Steamboat Willie was a direct characterization of Steamboat Bill Jr. The movie had come out by Buster Keaton just a year before, and there are memos showing that Walt Disney said, make a cartoon based on that. It was still in copyright. But he was allowed to do it. Okay? And now, look what has come from mm -hmm. Disney. Their whole business is based on reusing, manipulating, mashup maybe, of pre-existing content. But then when you try to use Disney... You try to use Disney, they're going to come down on you with a big hammer. they've come down on libraries. They, they, they've come down on libraries, they've come down on daycare centers, they've come down all over the place. Now, I'm not here to pick on Disney, I'm just using them as an example of kind of what we've gotten ourselves into. Now, I mentioned earlier DJ Danger Mouse. That's actually the guy in the background of this picture. He later went on to form a group uh, after he was told, take down your content, um, called Narls Barkley. Okay, the song Crazy. Remember that? That's them now. That's DJ Danger Mouse in the back. Okay? And what some people have argued is, is well, now it's okay. See, he's, he's, he's working now for the music industry. Yep, the music industry told him that the art he was doing before wasn't okay, but the art he's doing now, now that we're paying him, is okay. Yeah. <laughs> what some would argue, and I will do so too, is that we've created what's called a clearance culture. In other words, we have, we have painted ourselves into such a corner with copyright that we have to ask permission for everything. Okay? I, I'm not sure how many people are from academics or public libraries here or whatever, but you know, how many of you have ever heard someone say, well, you better get permission because we don't want to get sued? Okay? This is generally the, the legal advice you've got to get because your, your city, your town, your institution doesn't want to be sued. Well, the problem is, is when you ask, even when you don't have to, you establish this precedent that says, well, that person asked, so I better ask, so the next person better ask, and we kind of give up that whole concept of fair use. Okay. Cory Doctorow, who, who I will uh, mention again, um, has, has said, and, and I'll quote him on the next slide too, that fair use now is the equivalent of the right to hire a lawyer and defend yourself. Nice. Right? Because it is that affirmative defense. In order to prove that what you did was fair use, you first have to be sued. And nobody wants to be sued because nobody's got the money, so we ask. And Corey, who's very big in this area, also says that the problem with copyright at its core is that it treats all creators the same. I create content, 
I know Krista creates content, Cory Doctor creates content, he's a best-selling author, I'm not equating myself <laughs> with him necessarily, but you know, we all create content and copyright is a single set of rules for everybody. And even if they work, some people don't necessarily want to follow those rules. Right? So the problem is, is, is there an alternative? And the alternative comes from a law professor who was at uh, Stanford, I believe he's gone back to Harvard, he was at Harvard before, he, he keeps going from coast to coast, I can't remember where he is right now, by the name of Lawrence Lessig. He actually sued against the, the federal government for the last extension of copyright. And it went all the way to the Supreme Court. And if you read the copyright law of the Constitution, it says that Congress can establish this copyright, yada, 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 for a limited time. And I mentioned that originally it was 14 years. Now in many cases, it's well over 100 years. And his argument was is that violates the spirit of the concept of for a limited time. Guess what? He lost. <laughs> yeah. All the way to the Supreme Court, he lost. The Supreme Court said, well, it's, Congress, it's up to Congress to, to decide what a limited time is. Okay. So he lost. Um, and so he said, okay, there's, there's maybe there needs to be an alternative. So he created what is now known as the Creative Commons. If you look back in the history of the term commons, it was originally for grazing purposes. There was the land that was shared by everybody. So he said, why don't we create a commons of creative content that other people can use? The website is at creativecommons.org. website looks something like this. And the idea behind Creative Commons, where I said earlier that copyright is based on restricting rights and reserving rights for certain people, Creative Commons is an allowance of rights. It's a giving of rights to others by the person who created that content. Right. So the idea is, let's say, and uh, for simplicity's sake, I'll use photographs as, mm -hmm. as my main example here, because I take a lot of photographs, as, as some people well know. <laughs> Post them all on Flickr, and I take a photograph, and I can then choose what rights I want to give other people to reuse that content. Okay. Under traditional copyright, I would put it on Flickr, it would say, all rights reserved, and everybody who wanted to use it would have to ask me permission. Or I could sue them for violating copyright. Okay. Not that I have any money to do that. <laughs> but okay. So, but I'm you know I'm pretty free with my content. You know I'm not necessarily looking to make money off of it, especially with the photographs. Although I have, I have sold photographs. So what I have to do is I have to choose what rights I wish to kind of give to others. Okay. And so each right has a symbol that matches with it. This is the first one. This is known as the attribution right. And basically every single Creative Commons license you can put on something has this one requirement that says, if you are going to reuse my content, you must give me credit because I created it in the first place. So I can put up a photo and say, you can do whatever you want with it as long as you give me credit. Tim O'Reilly, the head of O'Reilly Media, once said that the, the, the problem for most creators is not piracy, it's obscurity. Mm -hmm. In other words, I would rather people knew me than necessarily one person paid me a lot of money. Although I realize if you paid me enough money, I could probably change my principles. But <laughs> I'll be honest. <laughs> okay. All right. Then what I can decide is whether or not I would allow commercial use of my content. So most content I post on Flickr is licensed under attribution non-commercial, which means you may use it as long as you give me credit and you're not making money off of it. Mm -hmm. Now, anybody who's thinking, well, what does making money off of it mean? We'll come back to that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay? Yeah. Uh, point, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, and I have a slide specifically on that issue. I can also say I do not want to allow derivative works. So let's say I could say, yes, use this photo, but give me credit, don't sell it, and don't change it. Don't crop it, don't rotate it, don't whatever. If it was a, um, a, a novel I wrote, no derivative works would mean um, you can't turn it into an audio book. You can't make a play out of it. You can't change the work. You can't do an abridged version of it. Okay. In my case, I say, if you want to change it, go ahead. I generally do not do the no derivatives 
uh, part of the license. If you're the kind of person that is into those mashups, like you're talking about before, you would want to encourage yes. that kind of you thing know, too. Yeah. Please use my photo, crop it to your needs, place it in your collage, as long as you say where you got that photo from. Mm -hmm. I don't care. Speaking of that, I won't spend much time on this, there is a remix allowance you can also do. You can specifically allow for remixing. This mostly has to do with musical content. So since I don't create any musical content, I'm not intimately familiar with that version of the license. You can then also add what's called a share alike license, which means that if you reuse my work, you must also share the work you created based on my work under Creative Commons. You know, kind of a pay it forward sort of scenario. If you use the same Creative Commons license I chose, is that what this means? I, I'm or? not 100 percent sure if you have to use the exact same one, okay. but you do have to kind of relicense it under Creative Commons. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I, that's a very good question. I've never actually dug into to that level. I don't use this one. Um, I found that actually I started using it, mm -hmm. and when I took that off, I think it tends to scare some people because not everybody does Creative Commons. So they might, so know how, so they they might too much trouble right. So I'll go so. find something else to yeah. use instead. So my general license on ninety nine point nine percent of my content is attribution, non commercial. Give me credit, don't sell it. And then I have had organizations, including Library Journal, email me and say, "We want to print this in photo in Library Journal. We'll give you twenty bucks." <laughs> okay. Actually, Library Journal said we can't pay you. I said, "Well, your Library Journal, okay." Fine. <laughs> Um, a French magazine said we'll pay you 50 euros. I said, okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to argue with that. All right. So how do you actually set up this license? Well, the easiest way to do it is you can go to creativecommons.org. There's a license uh, link. You bring up this form. I've got a zoomed in on it there. And you basically just answer, answer a very couple simple questions. One, do you want to allow commercial use of your work? Two, do you want to allow uh, modifications? Yes. Yes, as long as others share alike, or no, which would be no derivatives. And then the jurisdiction of your license, you do need to pick which country you're in. I, I do believe we have an attendee that's at, is either in or will be going back to Brazil. You'd have to look at the list, um, but I, I, I'm assuming Brazil does have a license available. Because there is actual legal contract behind this, which has to be written in your jurisdiction. Right, so there's a whole list of 30, 40 countries available in that list. Then if you want, you can add some additional metadata, if you would like, down below, under additional information, and then you click select a license. So once you do that, what do you get out of the back end? Well, the first thing you get is you get a little icon that you can place in or on the work. So this would say that I have licensed this work under Creative Commons under the attribution non-commercial license. And if the user clicks on that, they'll get what's called a Commons deed. And that is a brief explanation, kind of in simple English or language of said country, that says, here is what you are allowed to do without asking permission of the creator. I am giving you this permission. You are free to share it, and you are free to remix it, as long as you give me credit and you use it in a non-commercial way. Kind of pretty straightforward. You will also get what you can link to off of that is the legal contract behind this. That's as big as I can make to dip it on the slide. That is the US license. Okay. So far these licenses, is, to my knowledge, have not been challenged in the United States. But they have been challenged in other countries and they have been held up in every case in those courts. Um, if you violate my Creative Commons license, I then have the right to sue you under traditional copyright law. Basically is what this says. Uh, I have had people violate, violate my CC license, and I sent them a polite email, mm -hmm. and sometimes I know these people, and I, I hate to do it, but I kind of like, um, you know, uh, Steve, I, I'm making that name up. Um, you kind of used my photo, and you forgot to give me credit, and you say, oh, sorry, and they fix it immediately. I've had other websites who just are complete not getting it, and I was just like, you know, just give me credit. Mm -hmm. and they're like, oh, no, we took it down. I'm like, okay, whatever. You know, you didn't have to do that. You'll also get some HTML that if you're putting this on a web page, you can post that in the header of your HTML. It's metadata. Um, and what this will then allow to do, for example, there's a plugin for Firefox that will look for this code. And if it finds it, it will put the appropriate icon down in your status bar at the bottom of the screen. So you know as you're surfing around if you find some, found something that's licensed under Creative Commons. 
Yeah, so, you know, catalogers like metadata. <laughs> Don't tell anyone. Um, little sidebar here, there are some other licenses that are supported through the website. Um, you can license things in the public domain and founders copyright and what's known as the GNU public license and music sharing and wiki. I just want to say that these are available. I, 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 I have not studied them in all too much detail. There's also another one that is called CC0, which started about last year. Um, it's like public domain, but not really public domain, but basically says, I put this work out, do whatever you want with it. You don't even have to give me credit. Um, but, uh, yeah, but then it gets into patent and trademark stuff down below, and it, it gets really, really weird, but if that sounds like something you're interested in, go into the website and take a little more uh, look into that. Um, so are there other ways to assign CC licenses to content? You know, maybe you got something you don't want to go to that form every single time. Okay. Well, in Flickr, you can do this. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so you can set a default of all your Flickr photos. This is actually incorrect. My default is now attribution non-commercial, the second one down. Uh, I don't do the share alike anymore, and that's the default license. And now everything I upload to Flickr, by default, has that license on it. I can then, if I want, change the license on a photo-by-photo -photo basis or in batches if I want to. Or a whole set of things. Yes. I've yeah. done that. I have sets of, like, for example, I know some people do a mixture of things on their page, on their Flickr's, Flickr accounts that are personal and, and work-related and whatnot. Uh -huh. Other issues like the pictures of their children. I, I did I did an all rights reserved on the photos for my wedding. Yes, exactly. Yes. <laughs> I have pictures of friends, kids, and all those are all rights reserved. Yeah, I, I mean, that's... Take these pictures of these little kids right. and do something with them. Yeah. Although, we'll, we'll come back to that, too, under problems, because Creative Commons is not perfect. Um, another example, um, there is an add-in for Microsoft Office that you can install that will give you, under the file menu, a licensing choice and allow you to assign a Creative Commons license to a PowerPoint, an Excel spreadsheet, a Word document, whatever, and it will embed the code in the metadata of the file and give you the icon right into your file also. Now, I actually use this to assign the license to this PowerPoint. Um, so let me just run through some examples of where you can find CC license content uh, online. Uh, Flickr, as I've mentioned several times already, if you look in the bottom right corner there by the red arrow, you will see that there is a license set. Um, that one in that case is uh, attribution, non-commercial, share alike. Okay, and because I'm logged in, I have that little edit where I can change it if I want to. Anybody else would click on some rights reserved for a brief explanation. Um, SlideShare, which is a service we use here a lot at the Commission for posting uh, our PowerPoint presentations and some of these videos starting uh, this week. Mm -hmm. um, and you can see, again, with the red arrow, this would be a, a non-commercial attribution share alike license also. Um, Web Junction, now they've completely redesigned. It doesn't look like this anymore. I seriously <laughs> need to update this slide. However, this they do license their content under Creative Commons. This is an actual an article that I published with Web Junction several years ago, 2007, if you And you will see there's a CC icon kind of in the bottom center there. Uh, they, have a, they were using a generic icon, and you have to click on it to actually see which license it was under. Uh, you know, kind of optional. Um, and then Cory Doctorow, who I have mentioned already, uh, he actually uh, publishes novels. He licenses everything he does and makes it available for free online under a Creative Commons license. So you can buy his new book in Barnes & Noble or Amazon or Borders. I don't want to pick a particular one. Um, or you can download it completely for free under a Creative Commons license from his website in many, many formats. And in fact, if you see there, Dorothea Salo, she's a librarian. She actually created one of the versions of this particular book. Um, I've got one in there, too. I created a version of one of them. Um, and because his license allows us to create the different versions, it would be a derivative. So maybe one's HTML, one's EPUB, one's plain text, one's a Word file, et cetera. Um, so there you go. And kind of the last example I'll give you here, this is another video you can look up on YouTube called The Flickr Song. Mm -hmm. <laughs> This is uh, by Jonathan Colton, who was a uh, computer programmer who decided to quit his day job and uh, create music. Uh, he did a song called Code Monkey, uh, Re Your Brains, a song about zombies, uh, various other things. Those of you who know who he is are probably laughing right now. Um, and what he did for the first year after he, he uh, quit his job was he released one song a week for 52 straight weeks. 
and license them all under Creative Commons. And this example, though, he kind of did a little bit of a reversal. He went through Flickr and found random Creative Commons licensed photos. <coughs> Excuse me. And then wrote a song to match them. Very cool song. It is a funny song, yes. Um, so just go to YouTube, search for Flickr song. Uh, Jonathan Colton, C-O-U-L-T-O-N is his name, if, if, if that helps you narrow it down. It's an amusing song, and he gives all the credit for everybody's photos at the end of, uh, at the, end of the video. So let's say now you want to create something using Creative Commons content. I do this all the time. Okay? I create PowerPoints. I'm looking for photographs to put in the PowerPoints. I need to find content that I don't need to ask permission to use. So there's a couple of options. First is you can go to search.creativecommons.org, look something like this, and most of the major search engines today, including the ones listed here, Google, Yahoo, Flickr, do have under their advanced search the ability to limit your results to Creative Commons licensed content. In this case, this interface just kind of presets that for you. As you can see here with the Google example, search only pages that are free to use or share. Okay. Um, Specifically looking for photographs, I use a service called CompFight, C-O-M-P-F-I-G-H-T dot com. We'll put that in the links for this presentation. It's probably already there, actually. Um, and uh, what that does is it searches Flickr in a very easy-to-use interface, but I can say, please give me anything that I'm allowed to use under Creative Commons, and I get amazing results from that. And, and we're going to come back to that in just a second here, because... I've kind of given you the copyright end of it, what led up to Creative Commons, how Creative Commons works, but it's not perfect. Are there any problems with Creative Commons? And some people would argue there are problems with copyright. I'm not here to say that Creative Commons is perfect. There are issues you need to be aware of, so let me take a few minutes to kind of run through those. Um, the first complaint that some people have with Creative Commons that is once you license your work, it's, it's technically an irrevocable license. Yes, no, and sort of is kind of the answer. Let's say I license a work and I say attribution, non-commercial, share alike. And then six months down the road I decide, you know what, really, I don't care what you do with it, just give me credit, so I change it to just attribution. I now change the license. Well, then somebody does some, or actually, I should give a better example. Let's say, originally, I just said attribution. Then six months down the road, I said attribution, not commercial. So I made it more restrictive. And then somebody does something commercial with it. Well, now it gets into the argument of when did they find it, and what was the license when they found it. Um. You're not supposed to change your licenses. Now, under traditional copyright, eventually things go into the public domain. But technically if you license something, things don't technically ever go into the public domain because you're not supposed to change the license. I mean, I'm getting a little, you know, policy wonkish here, but it is a legitimate criticism of how Creative Commons works. This was a, the rest are a little easier to understand for most people. This one, negative market effect. You get this a lot from photographers. Professional photographers who take stock photography and try to sell it do things like iStock Photo and other websites. Then Flickr comes along, and all of us amateur photographers who post 25,000 photos in their Flickr account covering any topic you could possibly conceive of, some of which those photos might actually be good. <laughs> okay? I, I got a couple photos I think are okay. Um, and we give them away for free. We are now, we are the negative market effect on the professional photographers. They, they, they're afraid of losing business from us. Exactly. They're afraid of losing business because we're giving our stuff away for free. To which, to be completely honestly, I have to say, I'm sorry. Deal with it. Yeah. I, I, mean, I, I mean, I understand their point, but markets change. Okay? I have sold photos. I'm also not trying to make a living off of selling photos. So, I, I you know, but it's... It's an issue. And here's that one. What is non-commercial? <clears throat> the, the example, in my case, my point of view on non-commercial for my content 
and through a lot of other people I've talked to on the Creative Commons who license their content basically means don't sell it. Okay. Or if you, so if you print it in your magazine and you sell your magazine, you're technically selling the photo. Okay. You print it in a book and you sell the book, you're selling the photo. You print it out, you put it in a frame, you're selling the photo. Okay. But the situation I ran into, the, 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 the one of the two times that I got the DMCA takedown notice, I took a, a, a book that was licensed under Creative Commons and said attribution, not commercial, the whole book. And so I posted it on a website called Scribed uh, and gave the guy credit and I wasn't making a dime. I posted it up for other people to be able to read. The author of the book sent Scribe a takedown notice because Scribe had ads on their website. So by posting his content on their website, he thought that they were selling his work. Well, they weren't selling it. They were making money off of his work by his work being there. Scribe, I, I, I talked to both Scribe and the author. We did, we did have a very good conversation. We basically agreed to disagree. Um, Scribe agreed with me, but legally, because he was the owner of the content, they had to take it down. And he and I agreed to disagree. <laughs> so, you know, that's, hey. that's going to be a personal issue right. for each creator is, do I care that my thing is out on a website that anyone can go to and see for free, right. that I'm actually selling my item, but over here next to it is an ad that if someone reading my thing happened to click on that ad, the company would make money. Is right. that, do I care? Is that bad? Yeah. Let me give you one other quick example. Mm, up to, that's, up to the one person to decide. There's no one here. Yep. Um, I work for the government, so I'm nonprofit. <laughs> <laughs> but every once in a while, I get paid to speak mm -hmm. outside of my employment. Okay, uh, you know, a conference will call me, another state will call me, say, hey, you know, and I take a day off and I go drive out to wherever and I give a talk and they give me some money and I go back to work the next day. If I use a photo that was licensed non-commercial in one of my presentations that I got paid to give, is that a commercial use of that photo? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if you can tell, but Chris's head is starting to <laughs> spin just a little bit here. The general consensus is no, but I could see somebody making that argument. Yeah. And nobody's called me on it. You made money, but it wasn't just because of that one picture in your 60 slides. I, right, I didn't sell that photo, yeah. and I probably could have done it without that photo. Mm -hmm. And chances are my presentation ends up getting posted for free online for anybody else to see anyways. So, you know, mm -hmm. if you find your photo in one of my presentations, do it. And, and I've gone to people at conferences saying, hey, I recognize that photo. I didn't see you gave me credit. Mm -hmm. And they're like, Oh, the credit was at the end. I was like, okay, good. <laughs> um, another issue, unintended use. Uh, this again happened to me. Um, for those of you that know me, one of my things I'll get on a soapbox on every once in a while is, is about signs in libraries and no cell phone policies. I am, I am, we can give a whole other presentation on why I don't like cell phone policies. And there are no cell phone, cell phone policies. And so this is a photo I actually took that said, please turn off cell phones in the library. And I posted it to my Flickr account. And it got used to this blog post on a PBS blog. I was like, I thought this was cool. I'm like, hey, and they gave me credit. You click on the photo, it goes to my Flickr account, whatever. Here's the problem. It was used to illustrate the concept of, in the worst of the worst category, don't use a cell phone in, while in the library. I completely disagree with that statement. Very, but yeah. they're using my photo to illustrate that point. This is an un unintended use of my photo. Okay. Now, I couldn't complain that he used my photo because he did follow my license. Mm -hmm. I mean, I could have complained, but whatever. But luckily, because it was a blog, I just wrote a comment yeah. saying, thank you for using my photo, but by the way, I completely disagree with you, and here's why. Yeah. So when you let yourself out there, when you put your stuff out and you don't make them ask your permission, it could be used in a way you don't like. And then you can decide what you want to do about it. Do you want to tell them? I could have requested he take it down, mm -hmm. but under the license, he did everything right. Mm -hmm. And the last one uh, is uh, right of publicity. Mm -hmm. There is another law here you do have to take into consideration when you are using a photo of a person. 
This actually happened um, to Verizon Wireless, where they used a Creative Commons licensed photo of a person in an ad campaign. Mm -hmm. And the problem is, is the person in the photo has a right of publicity. And even though the use of the photo was legal, the use of that person's face was not because they didn't get their permission. That person didn't get permission. Right, yeah. The, the subject of the photo did not get permission. Um, and, and Verizon got, got their hand slapped for that one um, because they didn't ask. So the moment you start using the images of other people to promote a particular thing, then, you know, whatever. You know, and I almost wonder now, thinking about it, if, if you can, since you can see my silhouette in that picture, I wonder if I had a right of publicity argument, but probably not. So those are the problems that you can run into with Creative Commons. And you need to at least give a passing thought to them before you decide to use Creative Commons if you want to, because you can run into those problems. So, how can Creative Commons be used in libraries? I basically got three points here that I want to make about the application of Creative Commons in libraries. And the first one is to teach your patrons and or students to use CC licensed works. Right? We have a teaching opportunity here. Right? Some of us, I know, cringe when dealing especially with students where they just want to pull anything they can off the internet and use it. And, and I've got a 16-year-old in my house. She's about to graduate high school, and she's had to do PowerPoint presentations for school over the last couple of years. And she would just kind of pull pictures and images off the Internet. And I said, okay, well, now, regardless of what I think of how copyright should work, and whether I think that should be fair use, and all of these other things, let's teach her a way that, that she can learn that here is a good way to do it, and you won't have to worry about this stuff. So I said, go to comfight.com. Search for snakes, you know, make sure you set that you want stuff you're allowed to use, and then anything you can use, you're allowed to use as long as you create a URL back to the original in either credits at the end or at the bottom of the slide in a little tiny text or something like that. And if nothing else, she found much better photos than she had found before just randomly than just randomly Googling snakes or whatever. I mean, she found some great photos. She did some really great presentations, I think, that way. Um, and then, you know, and she, she gave the original creators credit. She didn't have to worry about, you know, violating somebody's rights. She just did it. And I think we can find those opportunities in working, if, if you're school librarian especially, but even in public libraries and academics definitely also. Um, you know, learn how to create a Commons works and then teach your patients and students about that. Um, License your work under Creative Commons. I do. Please, yes, yay, Krista. I mean, I do too. I mean, some of you might be doing it already in something like Flickr, um, but, you know, if you're going to put up a, a PowerPoint somewhere, license that. You know, if, if you are an Office user, get that plug-in, um, add that content, that sort of thing. I mean, you know. I even did it on, because I've seen other people do this on my personal blog. I put a little, yep. I've seen other, other bloggers have done this. It's not work-related, it's my own thing. I do work-related stuff on it, but a little Creative Commons mm -hmm. license on that, because, you know, I wrote the stuff, and I just want to be sure. It's a yeah, cover. yeah, let people use it. I mean, you know, some would also argue that if you put it on the web, you pretty much want people to copy. You, you, you've got to expect that somebody's going to copy it at some point. Hmm. So try to encourage them to give you credit. <laughs> And then the last one, and this is where I, I'm, I'm like this lone voice in the wilderness, I swear. <laughs> um, but catalog Creative Commons works. We've started a project. We've gotten a little bit away from it, but I, I, I'm, next couple of weeks we're going to kind of kick it back up again. Uh, but actually finding Creative Commons license works online and actually cataloging them and making them available. And in most cases, this is digital content. So it's, it's not necessarily too difficult. So let me just talk briefly about what we've done here at the commission. Um, one thing we've actually done in, in very limited circumstances was we have actually printed and bound CC licensed whole books. Uh, Lawrence Lessig's books uh, have electronic versions that are allowed, and he doesn't say no derivatives, so we created a bound book. Um, we've done that with one or two Cory Doctorow's novels. Um, in fact, he even quoted, you know, he said it was all kind of awesome or something yeah. like that when he found out we had done this. Um, Trigger, Happy, Trigger Happy by Stephen Poole. This is actually the author that I got into the debate about posting it online with. Uh, he's the one who said you've got to take that down. He was cool with this, <laughs> but he didn't like it, it, it being on Scribe. Um, and uh, some other ones. Uh, back, 
up just a second here. With, with these three books that we actually had bound, we sent them to the state printing department. Uh, and then our the, the person who actually did the sending over actually got a phone call saying, um, we can't print whole books. That's against copyright. <laughs> and so we had to call them back. Them about yes. And we had to say, no, it is okay. The state will not get sued. These are allowed under Creative Commons. So we had to do a little, little teaching moment mm -hmm. there with the state printing office. Um, this was actually a six-page electronic pamphlet that we cataloged, Tips for Comfort Bloggers. Um, we've, we've even cataloged a, a fan fiction Firefly novel uh, for that. It actually was done by a professional science fiction author. Uh, but we've, we've cataloged some of that. Um, the Maintain IT project has cookbooks that they've licensed in a Creative Commons. We've added all of these things to our collection. Not cookbooks for cooking. Oh, yeah, sorry. The technology <laughs> cookbooks. For, for those cookbooks. Not They're for computer and technology issues and stuff mm -hmm. that they just have given them the yep. Yep, and we founded other things that are available online, classic uh, texts, things like that, uh, that, that have been uh, licensed under CC. And we've added them to the collection. We've actually created OCLC records for these things. We have linked back to the original location we found them, but we've also created an archive copy on our own server. Um, so in most cases, PDFs, and um, we've linked to them. So, you know, you will always be able to get to them through even if uh, through us even if the original uh, item did do it um, but there were some questions raised during this project um, and to, to which I will also add I'm not a cataloger <laughs> yeah. oh in fact that slide was later um, some people asked well are we competing um, you know if, if we post a copy on our system but maybe we also offer that same content through a vendor that uh, we deal with. Say, uh, I'm not saying this has net library. They have ebooks. Yes. So if, if we... There's an ebook version of one of those. Yeah, there's an ebook yeah. version through net library which we pay for, but then we're also putting it for free. Is it competition? We didn't really answer that question. <laughs> we just, somebody just went, was that competition? And we went, hmm. And we, did. And we never went back. <laughs> um, our collection development policy. Uh, we're a state library. We don't generally put fiction in our collection. We definitely don't put Firefly fan fiction, science fiction in our collection. Mm -hmm. um, so, so a discussion needed to be had about you know what is our mission, and it was agreed that within the scope of this project, I have been given some additional latitude uh, to add things that we wouldn't typically add to our collection for the purposes of As this. As the Nebraska Library Commission, part of our mission is helping and teaching our libraries in the state to do mm -hmm. various things. So we do a lot of things by example. Yep, and this, and this would be those. one of them. We have plenty yep. of libraries that will have fiction, and here's a way mm -hmm. we've done it so you can do it. Yeah. Now, um, a, a couple of, of bands over the years have also released complete albums under Creative Commons. And I keep trying to find a public library who will literally burn one of these albums to a CD and add it to their collection. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought I had one, and yeah, then I lost them. Uh -huh. um, but uh, music CDs are really are now pushing our collection development policy. So I really, if, if, if you're a public library who wants to like get into this, give me a shout. I will help you out, I promise. Um, some of the cataloging issues that were raised, and this is where I stress, uh, I, I'm not a cataloger. Um, who is the publisher? Um, is, you know, if Cory Doctorow published a book and it's printed by Tor, uh, but then he puts it on a server for free download, is he the publisher or is Tor the publisher? Okay. Um, another question was, that was raised, and this is where I prove I'm not a cataloger because I don't even understand this. Um, place of publication is a required field. Mm -hmm. So if he wrote it while he was in San Francisco, he published it while he was in Toronto, it's on a server in New York City, and he now lives in London. Where is the place of publication? Where he was sitting at the time. All right. <laughs> and, and if you're linking yes. to our copy, which is on our server here in Nebraska, are we the place of publication? When you're linking to R, yeah. I don't know. Um, our cataloger solved it. I don't know what you did. <laughs> um, Check out our records. Yes, look at our records and, and find out. Um, so <coughs> um, that was fun. Um, Boing Boing is a, is a big monster blog that's out there. Cory Doctor is involved. Um, we started this project in February 2008. And we blogged about the fact that we were doing this. Include some of, of, of Cory's stuff. Um, and um, 
the, the, the blog hits that we were getting about that time on our blog at the commission here were seven, eight hundred hits, things like that. Just the one blog post we wrote about uh, this that Boing Boing pointed to, we got a, well over 2,000 hits. So there was definite interest in this project when it went out. It, it's, it's kind of slowed down a bit, but um, like I said, I'm looking to revive it. I'm looking for some partners, so if anybody's interested, uh, give me a shout. And with that, I'm just under time. We, got, we could probably take a couple of questions. Um, the, uh, the email address is wrong. Excuse me, my little pen here. Uh, but actually, it still works for right now. Uh, but ultimately, it should be michael.sowers at nebraska.gov. We'll update this before we, we will update this slide before we post it online. <coughs> there is where you can find all my Creative Commons uh, bookmarks. We'll also mirror those onto the uh, commission's account for Encompass Live. Uh, you can uh, find this and other presentations of mine there. We will also be mirroring this on the commission's uh, uh, slideshare account also. Yes. And if you look way down at the bottom corner there, you will see uh, that uh, I have licensed this under Creative Commons. It looks like I did do a share alike license. Um, there's three circles there. Our screen is kind of cut off. Um, it's probably cut off on theirs as well. Oh, okay. You can just barely see it. So, Wait, the presentation. Be able yes, to yes. We will. Everybody will get a link to all of this stuff yes, in the their email. Has been done, and this the link to this. All those will all be on the page with all the recording information that you will get emailed to you yeah, today or tomorrow. Yeah, end of the week, worst yeah. case. Um, so with that, we, we do have some time. We can go a little long. We we, we don't have a, a hard one hour cutoff here. Um, Chris, we just want to see if there's any questions outstanding. Um, if could, anybody does have any questions, feel free to type them into the question section of um, your interface. Or yeah. if you have a microphone you want to use, just let us know that. I have a mic on mute me and we can do that. And you can ask your question um, on your microphone. Yep. I realize it's a lot. Um, yes. You know, uh, Okay, we've got someone telling us they have no questions. Thank oh, you. Yes, but, yes. Thank, uh, well, you guys can say this as well. Thanks for this incredibly informative presentation. <laughs> no questions right now. Thank you. Thank you for all the good information. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot. It's really not um, as hard as you think about it. I, I've been listening to some recent talks that, that Corey Docker has given, and they, and they, they always ask him about him posting his, his stuff for free on the Creative Commons. And lately, and I, I have to edit his language just, just a little bit here, but, but lately he's been saying that most people, honestly, when they see a Creative Commons license, they think the person who created this isn't a jerk, and I shouldn't be a jerk either. Yeah. In other words, they don't necessarily understand what the license means, but it kind of implies that... It's like a do unto others yeah, kind of thing. It, it's, yeah, he doesn't use the word jerk, but I, uh, I, I, I mean, you know, kind of a... You know, this person understands that there's, you know, there's probably some things wrong with copyright. He wants people to share his or her stuff. Please do so, and please don't be a jerk about it. In other words, don't print it out and sell it, or, you know, something like that. Yeah, like, I do another or I pay it for, like you yeah. said earlier. You know what, they're being nice about it, I will too. And yeah. hopefully someone will follow me, mm -hmm. and it'll, yeah. Yeah. So. I know some people just hearing the word copyright makes them cringe. Yes. Because of trying to understand and figure out, especially in the library world, um, and I think this really helps clarify it a bit, you know, this presentation, this very boiled down information, and especially the Creative Commons stuff makes it, I think it makes me feel a lot more relaxed and comfortable with what's going on with my stuff and anything we do here at the Commission, that it's not the end uh -huh. of the world, it's not horrible, there's ways to, you know, protect yourself, yeah. but still be a good person. And, you know, and if you're in one of those institutions where, you know, the, the, the lawyers, the administration are very, very concerned about being sued and violating copyright and whatever. There is a ton of Creative Commons licensed stuff out there. Mm -hmm. And if you start mining that for good content, you can just completely avoid the issue. Yeah. You can stop making phone calls and emails saying, can I have permission to do this? Because you know you have permission by the license as it exists. You right? like have to live in a world just make your life easier. Yes, <laughs> yes, less fear. We need less fear in the world. So.
If there's nothing else, I don't think we have any urgent questions, nobody's typed uh -huh. in or anything, that I think we'll wrap it up. Right. Um, thank you very much for attending today. As I said, it's recorded. We'll get that up in the next day or so. Um, hope you'll join us next week. Our topic is um, Conducting Surveys 2. It's part two in a three-part series that Catherine Brockmeyer, one of our staff here at the Commission, is doing about doing surveying of your um, patrons and users on data collection next Wednesday. So um, check our website for that and sign up and, or any can I, other Can I throw something in? Yes, you can. And uh, for those of oh, you yes. participating in uh, Nebraska Learns 2.0, this good. month's thing is on polling and, polling and surveys. And surveys. Yes. So, uh, it was just you know. put out live yesterday. Mm -hmm. right. Yes, it's the second. So yes, if you're interested, if you're already doing Nebraska Learns 2.0, go and check out the new one. If you're not, Go to our, I don't know what the top of my head, go to our website, look for it. Um, I think it's anylearns.blogspot.com, but don't hold me to that. <laughs> um, check our site, um, maybe we'll link to it or something. Yeah, right Google now. search Nebraska Learns 2.0, yeah. you'll find it. <laughs> and um, join in if you want to. It's our ongoing 23 Things program where we're doing new items every month. And yeah, this month's actually com com um, goes right along with what Catherine's doing. Too. So thank you very much, and we will see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.